Our sequential New Testament reading is found in Romans chapter 10. So please turn with me in your Bibles to Paul's epistle to the church at Rome, chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth uh, those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of Faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith, which we preach." that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. For they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them, that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Amen. Well, we continue this evening in our exposition of the minor prophet Micah. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to where we last uh, left off last Wednesday, we find ourselves in Micah chapter 4, and our text this evening is verses 9 to 13. That's verse 9 to the end of the chapter, Micah 4. Now, why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies." Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled, and let our eye look upon Zion. For they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, And I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. When the weather service is predicting uh, a big hurricane, 
that is due to strike the coast of South Carolina or elsewhere in the eastern seaboard, there are various things that happen. First of all, people scatter, of course, to uh, prepare and to brace themselves uh, for the storm, protecting their property. Some people evacuate. But there's always a group of folk who, who have their eyes set even a little further, a little further forward than just bracing for the storm that is, that is coming. They'll begin charting a plan, a plan for rebuilding. Things will begin to be put in place, supplies designated and uh, perhaps plans drawn up and outlined so that there's a game plan on what to do on the backside of, of the hurricane. Now, in such a case, the storm is still coming. The hurricane will still demolish uh, the, the coast where it, where it arrives. But there is, in that planning, some degree of hope on the other side, what things will look like once everything has been put back together. Well, as we come to this passage in Micah 4, verses 9 to the end of the chapter, we have to remember a bit of the context in which we we find ourselves. Uh, Micah has been preaching a very difficult message. He has been coming to Israel and uh, exposing their sin and predicting that God will bring judgment down upon their heads, that he will chasten them, that it will be severe, in fact, cataclysmic. The end of chapter 3 In verse 12, the description is of Israel being absolutely demolished, laid in heaps, reduced, if you will, to rubble. And then we turn to chapter 4, and in those first five verses, we have this magnificent future that's set before our eyes, where God says, listen, now casting our eyes far into the future from Micah's day, he says, there's a day coming Israel, when I'm going to actually begin to gather all of the nations to myself, and they will stream like rushing rivers up Mount Zion to be taught of the Lord and to be instructed uh, by him. And of course, the question that comes in the, the mind of, of the Jew is, well, what of us then? There's judgment for us, blessings for the Gentiles. And we noted last week in verses 6 through 8 that the Lord uh, lays out Uh, some hopeful encouragements for Israel, that even uh, a remnant would be brought in by way of the gospel uh, into the kingdom, and that far more would lie uh, beyond that in the days days ahead, when it would be like life from the dead for them. And so now we come to this passage, and it's as if some of the pieces are beginning to be put together, where we have judgment coming, a blessing that is due to arrive far after that and in time to come. And how is it then that they were to respond and live at the present? And what happens is uh, we have three parallel sections, two of them at the end of chapter four, and then the third one at the beginning of chapter five. And all three contain a couplet. They contain a word of judgment, reinforcing what's been said, coupled with a word of promise, a word of encouragement of, of how the Lord will, will use that judgment. And so that's where we are. We're looking together at verses uh, 9 to, to, to 13. The storm is coming. Judgment is coming. And yet there is a hope for the remnant to cling to. There are promises that God has provided. And this indeed gives them uh, a road to recovery, if you will. So we're going to note two things uh, this evening with the Lord's help. First of all, the, the bad news, and then secondly, uh, the good news that Micah brings to them and by way of application and extension to us as well. First of all, in verses 9 and 10, we've just read it uh, together, uh, really verse 9 through the bulk of verse 10, the, the end of verse 10 actually contains uh, part of the good news. But it opens with the word now. In fact, each of these three sections open the same. Verse 9 now, uh, verse 11 now, and then at verse uh, 1 of chapter 5 with the word now. But he's speaking of a, a future now, if you will. He's not saying right now. He's saying now during the time that I am depicting. In other words, the judgment that is coming is still a century off 
right? This Babylonian captivity is 100 years from them, and then all the, the blessings are far uh, beyond that. And so he's describing these things in the present tense, but there are things that will actually transpire uh, in, in the future. And what's he say? Now why dost thou cry out loud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor uh, perished? This, this word cry is actually the word for kind of a, a, a shout of alarm. So it's, it's terror stricken. It's a, a blood curdling cry that's being described. Why is it that I hear this screaming in, in terror? And then he says, where's your king? You know, where's your, your counselor? You know, is not your king among you? What is he doing? He's, he's exposing uh, the, the corruption of the leadership that they have been living under. And he's saying, in essence, look, they're of no help to you. They're no help to deliver you. So all of the lies that have been sown are being uh, exposed to them. And there is uh, a very interesting contrast that's being drawn because the people as they are currently living are living high on the hog. So their, their kings are saying, all is well and all will be well. You know, we are the people of God and all will be well for us. And the false prophets are, are preaching peace, peace, where there is no peace to them. And saying, God is for you and, and uh, you should be encouraged. And so they're partying and they're living it up. But the fact is that they're living in rank disobedience. So the kings are leading them in this lawlessness. The priests are, are also capitulating and going along. And the prophets are filling their ears with falsehood. And so you have these people who are saying, we are the people of God, and we have all this abundance, and we're going to, you know, enjoy ourselves and live on all of the, the, the prosperity that we're enjoying while simultaneously transgressing the law of God. They are breaking his commandments. They're engaging in idolatry. They've corrupted his worship. They've polluted their lives with immorality and so on. And so here is, here is Micah saying, you will scream with terror. It's a wake-up call. And he's saying, now what? What of all the, the leaders that you've leaned upon and said, well, they, you know, we're following them. They say all is well. And he's saying, they're not to be found. They're not to help you at all. And so he goes on in verse 10 and says, uh, be in pain, labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. He's saying, I confirm your cry of terror. You are going to be like a woman in, in labor, and there is no way to get out of it. Just as a woman goes into full-blown labor, and in the midst of that, there's, you know, excruciating pain and sometimes panic, and there's no way to reverse it. There's no way uh, to turn back at that point. He's saying, yes, indeed, uh, you will cry and ought to cry. And he goes on, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. So thou shalt go to Babylon. Now this is very interesting because at the current time, who's the world power? The answer is Assyria, as many of you will know. Assyria has brought down its boot upon Israel, the northern kingdom, and Assyria has dominated uh, that portion of the world. They're, they're ruling with a strong hand. And yet here is Micah saying, no, Judah, you are going off. You're going to be carted like oxen off to Babylon. The only way for Micah to say that is by divine inspiration. Babylon at this stage of the game is not a player. They have not been raised up. They have not ascended. There's a time coming when they will rise and then overthrow Assyria. And they'll be the strong ones. And then they'll come to Judah and, uh, and bring their terror into, their, into the streets of, of Judah and so on. And so it's only by divine inspiration. There's a prediction of Babylonian captivity before Babylon is even of any significance. You say, well, you know, how is that possible? The answer is clearly because God is the one 
who is providing us with revelation. God is the one filling Micah's mouth with inspired words. So it would be similar to what we saw in Daniel. Daniel says uh, in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, listen, here's what's going to happen. You know, we have, we have Babylon, and that's, that's one thing. But then he speaks about, you know, the, the Greeks and the Persian, uh, the Greeks uh, and uh, uh, the Medes and the Persians, and then the Greeks and then the Romans. And he's depicting all of these nations which had n- nothing uh, to, to, uh, of any weight or significance at the time that he was depict- uh, de- de- uh, predicting it. And so here we have a word coming obviously from God. And if you go down to verse 11, he says, Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled, let our eyes look upon Zion. This is disastrous. He's saying the nations are going to come in on you. They're going to flock in on you like a a bunch of hyenas around a, a corpse of a gazelle or something. He says, they're going to gaze at you. They're going to gloat over you. They're going to mock you and turn you into a play toy. They're going to laugh at your ruin. The goal of these nations will be extermination, to completely obliterate you. Yes, the the nations are going to be raging against Zion. Now, the question is, that everyone should be asking is, why? This is review for most of us. Why is it that Babylon is going to cart them off, the nations are going to gloat over them, and so on? And the answer is sin. These are the people of God. But they have buried their heads like ostriches in the sand. They have stopped up their ears and covered their eyes to all that God has commanded them. And they, they have been convinced wrongly in their delusion that as the people of God, they can get away with all this wickedness. And the Lord is saying, no, sin comes at a cost. It comes at a high cost. And what you sow, you will reap. Be sure your sins will, will find you out. And so there's a word of, of chastening that is behind all of this. The Lord is saying, the consequences of your unbelief and your pride and your self-indulgence and your idolatry and your lawlessness, this is what it is, these disastrous uh, consequences. Now, I think it's a suitable word for us in our own generation because we live in a time of spiritual declension, do we not? And who can read the Bible, who can read the law of God, really the whole counsel of God, and look at the present circumstances and conclude anything else than the fact that we are in a state of spiritual declension? Uh, The nations, of course, our own nation is in flagrant rebellion against the Lord and is in uh, raging against the King of Heaven and, and, and seeking to... Uh, to war against him rather than submitting to him. But we look at the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and what do we find? Wow, there's a great deal to cause us concern, temptation even to despair, a departure from the doctrines that God has given to us to believe, a departure from the ordinances of worship that he's committed to us, a departure from the law that he's given to direct us as a, as a rule of life, the crumbling of Christian holiness and, and walk with the Lord. Instead, there is the stamp of worldliness on us. And yet the people uh, within the broader church, within America, I'm speaking very broadly, are thinking, let's live. You know, we'll party today and we'll party tomorrow and tomorrow will be just like it has been. All is well. There is noise and there is numbers among us and there's much that should be uh, giving us cause to celebrate. We have all this, these wonderful things. And yet it's delusional. It's delusional when we hold up the word of God and say, what does God say about who we are, what we're to believe, and what we're to be doing? 
And so we need to be mindful of that. We need to be searching our hearts. We need to be humbling ourselves before the Lord. We need to be looking with uh, sincere repentance to him and praying that the Lord would bring repentance generally to his people. All of this bad news has one aim, and that is to recover the people. The Lord is sending his word, and they're ignoring it. Sending his word, and they're ignoring it. So the Lord says, now I'm taking you to the woodshed. You wouldn't listen to what I've said, so now you're going to have to listen to what I'll do. And he takes them to the woodshed. He says there's going to be chastening. But that chastening is intended to turn them back to Jehovah, back to the Lord. And this is a universal truth throughout the whole of the Bible. The Lord chastens those whom he loves. If the Lord said, Israel, I don't want to cause you pain, you carry on. It would be utter catastrophe for their souls, spiritual destruction. But he says, I'm not going to let you go on on this suicide mission, this spiritual suicide mission. Instead, I'm going to bring down the rod upon you in order to arouse you out of your stupor and to recover you from your sin and to return you to a safe place, a place of true blessing, a place of true joy in obedience uh, to the Lord. Well, that brings us to our second point. And what we find is this, that the, the judgment is actually the beginning point of deliverance. So the judgment itself is the start of recovery. So secondly, the good news. If you go back to the end of verse 10, first of all, there the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. The place of judgment is the onset of recovery. There in Babylon shall I redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. And then verses 12 and 13, speaking now of the nations that are gawking at Israel, but they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass. And thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. The Lord is saying, I brought you, I'm going to bring you into Babylon, and that will bring you to the end of yourselves. In other words, you will be brought to see your helplessness and dependence, and I will intervene on behalf of my helpless people. And I will do so Exodus style. I will bring you out of this exile, out of Babylon, in ways that parallel how I brought your fathers out of Egypt with a strong hand. So I'm bringing you into Babylon to bring you to the end of yourself. It's like the prodigal who goes off and sits among the swine and fain would have eaten their husks. And he comes to himself. Right? He's being brought to repentance. This is the Lord's aim. But God goes further and he says, He who brought you into Babylon will bring you out of Babylon. He will bring you out of Babylon. He says in verse 12, All these nations who are going to come and storm you and are going to you know, tear on you and who are going to you know, uh, gloat over you, they are ignorant. Notice, they know not. They're ignorant of the Lord's thoughts. They're ignorant of God's plans. So they're like in a drunken stupor, right? They're, they're flailing around in a drunken stupor, but they, it's as if they're, they're completely mindless. They're ignorant. They don't know God's counsel or God's decision. They don't know God's plans, God's thoughts. They came to destroy, they're going to come to destroy Israel but God is actually gathering them for destruction. And so the point is, here is the Lord who is in control. And his people need a whipping. And he raises up Babylon as a tool, as one of his lackeys, to accomplish the work that's needed in order to bring about spiritual good for his people. But he says, Babylon better not get full of itself. Because little do they know, they're merely a tool that I'm employing to accomplish purposes for my kingdom. 
And in all of their pride and violence, I am going to bring it down upon their own heads. They've dug a ditch for my people, and they're going to fall in the ditch uh, themselves. They came to destroy. God's gathered them for destruction because he's the one who's in control. We see this kind of thing a lot of places. Let me just give you, for brevity's sake, one example from 2 Kings 19. It says in verse 25, Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it? And of ancient times that I have formed it, now have I brought it to pass that thou should that thou shouldst be to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. So he's speaking about uh, the judgment that's coming. But then he says in verse twenty-eight, because thy rage against because thy rage against me and thy tumult is coming up into mine ears, therefore I will put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way which thou camest. The Lord's saying to his enemies, you know, I'm going to use you for this purpose, and then I'm going to uh, turn, you, turn you back. In verse 13, it says that Zion will arise and thresh. That they will arise and flesh. That the, the yes, the, the, the floor is going to be filled with grain, but it will be Zion that will be trampling the grain. They'll be goring with, uh, with these these uh, horns, their enemies, they'll have brass hooves beating uh, the, the wheat, as it were, to separate the chaff uh, from the kernel. They'll be the ones actually pulverizing the nations. Now, there's an eschatological element here. I mean, there, in other words, there's, a, there's an element that, that casts our eyes forward, right? We see this in Ezekiel. We see it in the book of Revelation and elsewhere, where the Lord ultimately raises up his people to triumph over uh, their, their enemies. Here when it says, I will consecrate their, their gain and their substance, the, the Hebrew word is haram, which is uh, to put something under the ban. So it's devoted to the Lord for destruction. Just like when Joshua went in and some of these cities were put under the ban. They were consecrated to the Lord, devoted to the Lord by being put to destruction. That's what's being noted here. And this is the kind of language we sing about in the Psalms. We sing about it in Psalm 83. We sing about it in Psalm 94 and in many other places. Those Psalms that we're accustomed to singing are putting this kind of truth into our spiritual bloodstream. It's getting us to to think and to be shaped into these sorts of ideas where, where the Lord is intended to do, is intending to do strong things for his people, and that includes uh, the destruction of, of, his, of his enemies. So that the winners, described in verse 11, are actually the losers that are described in verse 13. The Lord has turned things around. Why is this? Because Christ is king, that's why. And as king, he's the one ruling and defending his people. As king, he's the one restraining and conquering his and our enemies. So though, though God's people are very much at the front of what's being described in this passage, it's actually setting the Lord forth. It's showing us Christ. It's saying Christ is the one who is ultimately ruling and reigning over all these affairs. He's controlling it. And he's subduing, he's restraining, he is conquering uh, his enemies while bringing spiritual good, even at the cost of pain, uh, to his people. So he uses enemies to chasten, but ultimately good for his people and destruction for his enemies. In Psalm 2, we have... A beautiful depiction, right? The nations are raging against Christ. So the nations are confederating together and saying, we don't want to obey Christ's law. We don't want to submit to Christ's reign. We don't want to follow Christ's word. It's the picture. Nations that are raging against the Lord's anointed. And the picture is, takes us from the nations to Christ himself. Here's the Lord's anointed, seated in heaven, ascended to the right hand of the Father, ruling with a, an iron scepter. He smashes the nations to pieces, and the Father gives to the Son 
these nations as his inheritance, to be enveloped, as it were, under the umbrella of his own uh, kingdom. And that's what, that's, that's reality. That's who Christ is. That's what Christ is and will uh, do. Which is why the psalm ends with, if you understand these things, be wise, therefore, kings. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, pay homage to him, lest ye perish in the way. Right? The pieces, all of the dots are being connected. Nations rage, Christ reigns and destroys nations. And therefore, if nations have any sense, they'll submit to the Lord, trust him, come under his hand and seek to honor him and to please him. That message is as relevant and as essential for us as it has been in any generation past or will be in any generation future. The nations need to learn that they are but men and that there is a king, another king named Christ who rules in the heavens and they best submit to him or they will suffer under his iron scepter. And what we need to have underlined for us is that whatever the Lord is doing with the nations, it is for the purpose of accomplishing something for his people. Right? The people are what are central. Babylon, up and down. Assyria, up and down. Persia, the you know, Medes and the Persians, up and down. The Greece, Rome, these come and these go. They accomplish the purposes. Rome was raised up and it was very useful in, in, in the work that God had for the New Testament church to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. It fulfilled its end, its purpose. What God is interested in is what he's doing with his own kingdom. And it's true in our own circumstances, right? The Lord is doing things, and it may be taking his people to the woodshed. But whether it's that or something else, God is moving the things of heaven and earth to accomplish what ultimately will be for the spiritual good of his people, even if painful. Because God himself is faithful to his covenant. God is always faithful to his covenant. And so here we have the road to recovery, if you will. The Lord is saying there's chastening and there's going to be recovery and blessing. In the meantime, those who are faithful in Micah's day and in our own, who love the Lord, who are submitting to the Lord, who are seeking to honor the Lord, are to walk in the hope that comes in fearing the Lord. We're to cling to these promises that whatever it is that God is doing with us or will do with us, there is hope for what is produced by it, what will come out of it as, as a result. And that's what sustains God's faithful, believing people in the midst of turbulent times. We can brace for the storm, but we are also preparing, looking for what the Lord does on the backside of that as well. May the Lord bless these things to our hearing. Let's stand for prayer. Our gracious Lord and our God, we confess that you are altogether wise, that you do all things well. We are thankful that you are faithful to your covenant promises. We are thankful that you love your people enough to chasten us individually and corporately at times in order to bring us out of the stupor of our delusion and to bring us, O oh Lord, to uh, the sweet fruitfulness of uh, righteousness, the fruits of, of uh, repentance. Uh, we thank you, O oh Lord, that you have uh, a plan for your kingdom in this world and that you are bringing forward uh, your own cause. Uh, grant, O oh Lord, spiritual discernment to us uh, that we might take your word and think your thoughts as we analyze our own uh, circumstances and our own situation in the day in which we live. O oh Lord, do us good. Help us to walk as those with great hope, invincible hope. Help us to walk as those who desire your glory above all else. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's respond to the reading and preaching of God's word by singing from Psalm 60, verses 1 to 4. The tune is Coles Hill, number 42. Psalm 60, we sang these words this past Sabbath, but we come back to them again this evening because of their relevance in response to what we've just heard. O Lord, thou hast rejected us and scattered us abroad. Thou justly hast displeased been. Return to us, O God, the earth to tremble thou hast made, therein didst breaches make. Do thou therefore the breaches heal, because the land doth shake. Sing verses 1 to 4. Stand for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.